Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Matt, for that introduction. Uh, I work for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, uh, which is an educational and human rights nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is a picture of the memorial uh, that we have, that we maintain. We're very proud of it, and if you come to Washington, you should visit it. And uh, in my job, like Matt said, I get to meet heroes. And I'm going to tell uh, you about three of them today. Uh, and I'm going to show you Instagram selfies that I've taken with each of them. And, uh, and I really think that the lessons we're going to take from their stories will add to this conversation we're having about heroes and heroism. Uh, before that, though, I want to make one point very clear. Um, we have the word uh, victims in our name, and we are constantly uh, really fighting, resisting. We're against communist oppression. But more than that, we are for freedom, for human rights. And I think it's very important to have that positive uh, definition. Okay. Um, really quick, human rights 101, so we're all basically on the same page. Uh, Every human being uh, has the right to life and security. Um, human rights includes freedom of speech, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom to practice your religion, and to peacefully assemble. Uh, and that's enough we need uh, for today. Um, you can read the uh, Human Rights Declaration uh, if you want more. Um, another point is that <clears throat> In many countries, uh, there's not a freedom of politics. They don't have, they don't elect their government in a legitimate way that, that we do, um, for example, in the United States, uh, democracy. And uh, you can go to jail if you do something the government doesn't like, if you vote uh, a way that they don't like, if you join an opposition party. Uh, there are a number of different things that they, that they do. So they have these political prisoners. And, Fortunately, we don't have those in the United States, um, but that is a reality in each of the three countries where uh, my heroes come from today. China, North Korea, and Cuba. This is Dr. John Lee Yang. Uh, when I met him, he'd just shaved his head, and he did that out of solidarity for a friend of his who uh, a pro-democracy dissident in China who had just been arrested. And so this is one of the first points I want to make about heroes. They support their allies, even with the small things, uh, because it really, really matters. With so many of these human rights fighters that we, that we meet, that I come into contact with, just letting them know that we are paying attention and that we care about their stories and that we are there to help them, to back them up, matters a lot. Dr. Yang was a, uh, in his youth, he was a member of the Communist Party, and he was really a rising star. He could have become a very powerful man. Um, but early on, he began to see things that he didn't like. He, in fact, he witnessed so much uh, corruption uh, that he decided that he couldn't be a part of that system. And this is the second point. These heroes that I'm talking about today are true to their conscience. That's really important. And uh, so Dr. Yang left the party uh, and came to the United States for graduate school. He was in California in 1989. He was 26 years old. And in China, some student protesters some students gathered in a place called Tiananmen Square and were peacefully protesting. Dr. Yang uh, made the decision to leave um, the security that he had in California and to go to uh, Tiananmen Square in support uh, to protest with these students. And, uh, and it got ugly. The Chinese communists rolled tanks into the city, and they deployed troops, and violence broke out. Hundreds of Chinese students were slain, and 
uh, and we call it the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Fortunately, uh, John Lee was able to get out safely and get back to California. But he made a decision a couple years later to go back again, which uh, is another important hero lesson. Uh, you don't win this game from the sidelines. These heroes have to be where the action is, and they're perseverant, and they put themselves at risk. Uh, in Shakespeare's words, once more into the breach. Well, Dr. Yang went once more into the breach, except this time the Chinese Communist Party uh, was paying very close attention to him, and they arrested him, and they accused him of spying, and they sentenced him to five years in prison, which he served. And <clears throat> the whole time, uh, human rights advocates, also the United States Congress, also the United Nations, were petitioning for his release because it was, he was unjustly imprisoned. Uh, he got out in 2007, came back to America, and immediately got to work. The first thing that he did was he walked from Boston to Washington, D.C., that's 500 miles. It took him 32 days. And he was doing a lot of uh, promotion. He was inviting uh, prominent community members and, and congressmen uh, and women to walk sections with him, that sort of thing. And the whole point of it was to, was to raise attention for uh, human rights abuses in China and to call for uh, American leadership in, democratic, in encouraging democratic reform. Uh, back to the Tiananmen Square Massacre. The Communist Party denies that it happened. It makes them look bad. It undermines uh, their credibility and their legitimacy. And its uh, Chinese citizens can't Google it. Uh, they can't talk about it. They can't, the, the families of the victims can't uh, pursue justice through, through authority. It, it's, it's a travesty. Um, and this policy continues today. Tiananmen Square Massacre is still uh, one of the most taboo subjects in China. To which brings me to Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift's initials are T S, Taylor Swift, Tiananmen Square, and she was born in 1989, which also happens to be the title of her epic tour that's going on right now. And the Taylor Swift 1989 tour is going to China in November. And she's selling these T-shirts. And. Chinese human rights people are paying attention to this now. They see this, and I don't think that, I don't think that Taylor Swift had clever, subtle, uh, political subversion in mind when she designed her concert swag. Uh, but I'll tell you what, some people are watching, uh, including the human rights folks in China who see this as a sign, as a, as a subtle sign, something they can do to help the Chinese remember. Uh, and also, the Communist Party censors are paying attention to what's going to happen. And this story is developing. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, I kind of like it. I thought about getting one. They're $40. <laughs> okay. My next hero that I'm going to talk about is a North Korean gal named Yenmi Park. She is amazing. She has a very harrowing story about her escape from North Korea and her life there. Um, I don't have time to tell it to you, but she did just uh, publish a book with Penguin and it's coming out and I haven't got my hands on it yet, but I'm going to, and if, if you are interested in what you're learning here about her, you can check it out. Oh yeah, there's a book. In order to live, it's called. Well, I need to talk about North Korea for a second. Um, 
it's not a, it's not a, pleasant, not a pleasant place. And, but many people right now know, uh, maybe know it, or uh, through the movie The Interview. It's not a good movie. I can't recommend it, especially watching it in the same room as your mother-in-law. Uh, but it helps me make a point here. It makes fun of North Korea in very crude and silly terms. Um, the problem with that is that there is absolutely nothing funny about uh, what real life is like in North Korea. Okay? Uh, when Yen Mi Park was nine years old, she uh, saw her best friend's mother executed by a firing squad. Her crime had been watching South Korean uh, television shows that were illegal and sharing them with her friends. It's a capital punishment to watch sitcoms in North Korea. Uh, another serious issue in North Korea that uh, is relevant to this story is famine and starvation. The, almost the entire country is malnourished. And, uh, and a lot of these famines and, and a lot of the starvation is very, very avoidable. So, Yen Mi's uh, father and mother were doing something that's pretty common. They were smuggling goods to Chinese traders in exchange for food to feed their family. Now, this kind of transaction is illegal in North Korea, in a communist country where, uh, theoretically, the government provides everything for everyone, uh, and it's free. Well, her father was caught and sentenced to 17 years in a hard labor prison. I can't get uh, into more of the details, but I'm like, I was about to roll into it, but it's really, really sad and scary. And, um, and you have to know that in, in North Korea, from a very little age, uh, North Korean boys and girls are, are taught to, really, they have this word called juche. It's more than a politics. It's sort of this weird combination of politics and religion. And they, they worship, they're taught to worship their um, political leader, their dear, dear leader. And he's, uh, he's the head of state. Actually, not technically. Uh, his father, who's like dead, is technically the head of state. And they're all still worshipped. Very, very strange behavior. You have to understand it. Uh, when you're talking about North Korea, though. So I mentioned earlier that it's uh, a capital crime. It's illegal to watch television. Well, when Yen Mi was young, she tells this part of the story. I love this part of the story. She says she watched an illegal copy of the Titanic, okay? And watching the Titanic taught her for the first time in her life that human beings can die for something other than the dear leader. Uh, like... They can, humans can sacrifice for other things, like love. Uh, that was very formative for her. Uh, today, Yenmi um, escaped South Korea, uh, North Korea, with her mother. She's in South Korea. She's um, she's going to college, and she is a very powerful uh, voice for for human rights. Um, but that assimilation process uh, after being a refugee is, is very difficult. She got connected with uh, some really great folks in South Korea who specifically help North Korean refugees. And she, she began showing signs early on that she was going to be really um, eloquent and persuasive. And people started noticing, including the North Korean government and they began um, issuing statements against her, slandering her. They even put her on a, a public target list that they keep, and this is a very serious deal. Uh, North Koreans have, a, the North Korean government has a history of uh, assassinating North Korean refugees in South Korea. And the South Korean officials contacted Yenmi to 
you know, to warn her, to let her know what the situation was and um, what her options were. And this brings her to this very serious boiling point in her life. She had every reason to be scared, to hide, to go farther away, to stop, uh, to stop speaking out against the oppression um, of the uh, North Korean regime and for the, uh, the freedom of the North Korean people. But she didn't, okay? She decided to do the opposite. And I love this. She decided to get as famous as she possibly could. She decided that she wanted to become so well known and so important and so powerful uh, that it, that it uh, became a liability, that it became untenable for the North Koreans uh, to, to, to kill her because it would be, uh, there would be such big backlash. And like, that's just, that is an amazing strategy. Um, it's tactically brilliant, and, but easier hard than done, uh, easier said than done, right? Uh, but she did it. And one of the things that she did is that she learned English, okay? Uh, she, she says that she watched the entire series of Friends <laughs> nine times. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, really, okay, so, so the point, there are two points that I want to make uh, about Yenmi's story. Um, one is this hero posture, okay? She didn't hide when she had reason to. Um, she, she faced her oppression and she defied it. And the second is she identified a, a particular task or skill that she needed in order to be successful and she mastered it, okay? Those are, those are excellent traits. Two things that I've pulled out for you. Uh, the last hero I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a Cuban man named Guillermo Farinas. Guillermo wasn't always a hero. His father had uh, fought in the Cuban Revolution with uh, Che Guevara. And Guillermo had followed in his father's footsteps um, fighting in the Cuban army um, in Africa in the 80s. He was a member of the Communist Party. He uh, was kind of doing his thing. Side, sidebar. Uh, how many of you know who Che Guevara was? Okay, do you probably recognize his face? Okay, uh, Che's portrait is the most reproduced image in the history of photography. And Che is represented in chic culture as a hero and a martyr. Uh, but Che murdered thousands of Cubans after they won the revolution. Uh, there was a political purge. And he, uh, he oversaw the execution, the political execution of people that they deemed a threat to their power. And he even uh, committed some of the executions with his own hands, on his own. Uh, he has blood on his hands. Not the kind of guy uh, we should call a hero. Not the kind of guy we should put on our t-shirts. Fortunately, Guillermo, although he was a Cuban soldier, like Che, is not like Che. Guillermo changed sides, okay? His change was gradual, but thorough. And it began like John Lee Yang's when he witnessed systematic corruption uh, in the Communist Party, okay? He, he was working in a healthcare union, and he had a position of prominence, and he, he was witnessing something that, that was setting off his conscience. And he brought it out to public. He testified. And the Communist Party, instead of dealing with it, punished him. And this is a hero lesson, okay? It's better to be loyal to principles than to a party, especially Communist parties. And heroes aren't afraid to 
quit their party if it's forcing them to compromise uh, on their principles or violate their conscience. One of the things I want to, one of the things I like about Guillermo's not like Che. This is a photo I got to uh, be a part of in June at the Library of Congress. And what's happening right here is Guillermo is inviting uh, Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. She's the most senior woman in Congress. Uh, he's inviting her to Cuba and he's offering to be her tour guide to show her how life is like for real Cubans outside of the tourist district in Cuba. Okay. Guillermo has adopted this uh, interesting technique. He conducts hunger strikes. He's launched more than 23 in his career, and he's used them to great effect. Okay. Uh, one quick example, during a 2003 crackdown in Cuba on journalists and dissidents, um, Guillermo's hunger strike helped put pressure on the government and secured the release of, of the imprisoned dissidents. Um, some of his strikes have lasted many, many days and months, and it's come at great cost to his, to his health. Um, and they've focused on issues ranging from internet censorship uh, to suspicious deaths of fellow dissidents, uh, police brutality, etc. And they've really sort of solidified him as, uh, as a very powerful voice for Cuban uh, freedom. Okay, those are my heroes. John Lee, Yen Mi, and Guillermo. Uh, and again, one of the things that is most important about each of them is they're against uh, communist oppression, against political oppression, but more than that, they all fight for the freedom of their people. Thank you. Thank you.